Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound podcast channel about electronic music and all things synth. I'm Rob Puricelli and in this episode I talk to Alex Ball, an electronic music technology historian whose YouTube channel is a goldmine of synth documentaries and demonstrations. Most recently, a film called Electromotive, the story of art instruments, a meticulously detailed look at the legendary synth manufacturer produced on behalf of the Alan R. Perlman Foundation. So I'm here with uh, Alex Ball, um, who you may know from uh, his YouTube channel. Alex, hello, welcome. Hello, how are you doing? Thanks for having I'm me. I'm very well, and how are, you, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm sat surrounded by synth, so that's always good, isn't it? Alex, before we go into detail uh, about the art video itself, can you just give us a little bit of background about what you do, what the whole channel is about, and you know, your, your background in music technology? So the... I work as a professional musician. I'm a music producer in the advertising industry. So I compose and produce and source and license uh, music for TV commercials. I've been doing for oh, 13 years or something okay. like that. Um, and I uh, am very lucky to do that. And I love that. But I started a YouTube channel about five years ago, I guess, just as a place where I could do little projects that were mine. because. Mm-hmm. I was working in music every single day, but I was always working for someone else. It's always someone else's project. Other people have say, and I just wanted a place where I was doing my thing. So I started off doing some videos. Originally, there was just some guitar stuff. And then I did some things with um, virtual orchestras, with VSTs. I did some recreations of film soundtracks with virtual orchestras. I did some, tried to recreate some 1950s recordings with virtual orchestras. And that's where it started. And that was what I just was doing um and so if you go onto my channel the first things you'll find is that and then a a little while later i got into synths in a well in a ridiculously big way but (laughs) (laughs) it's it's stuff um it i had been into synths for many years but i just i didn't own any hardware since i didn't have the space or the money um and it it finally got to a point in my career where i could get some stuff and I mm-hmm. thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. So I bought like a bunch of synths in one go. Like I thought, I think I bought three or four to start with. Um, and you think that that'll give you all you need, but as you know, <laughs> <laughs> you then yeah. wind up with twenty, don't you? Um, and so I started doing stuff with synths, and then through that, I started meeting other people and uh, who who live near me or who live abroad, all over the place, who started kind of collaborating with me lending me stuff if they were local uh, or I could go and get it or um, filming me stuff for me and sending it to me so that we could make videos with um, kind of a lot of vintage classic synths the kind of things Mm -hmm. that you saw as a kid you saw on top of the pops or on whatever and thought what's that amazing thing and then you always wanted it and and couldn't so it's became that and it's kind of grown and grown and it's like an avalanche (laughs) (laughs) it's become an uncontrollable monster and now it's become an uncontrollable monster so now i've got to the point where i'm making massive documentaries about you know famous synth manufacturers like the art film so dream job so you you (laughs) first came to my attention uh on a personal level because of your terminator 2 video somebody said hey Uh this guy's done a great video and it's all about the fairlight. And I'm like, okay, because there's half of me is like excited because I get excited about stuff like that. And the other half is like, has he got it right? And <laughs> because they're a passion of mine, you know, I'm, I'm always on the lookout because there is so much misinformation out there. But, boy, did you get it right. I mean, you did a great job, I have to say. Now I've got you here. I have to say that you did a fantastic job on that one. Thank you. Well, I've got to say, as I was just saying with people helping me out, two people in particular helped me with that. One was Chris who runs the channel Python Blue, and he he is the guy, the genius, who reverse-engineered some of the hardest sounds. I figured out a number <laughs> of them, but some of the really difficult ones that are like a combination of a bunch of sounds, he, he mm-hmm. was the guy. who. So he was a huge help. And then also Mike in Australia. So it was a truly uh, international <laughs> yeah. production. Um, and it was great, you know. Yes. And, and you got the guy that did the voiceovers as well, you know, in the, in the, <laughs> the Arnie voice, it was just great. Yes, so I was working with him. Yeah, I think that's kind of how I got the idea, actually, because we were doing this campaign with where oh, wow. he was the Arnie impersonator. And um, 
I said, oh, would you be up for doing this? And he said, yeah. So he, we did a couple. We did that one. We did one on the Predator score as well with the Synclavier as well, which yes. Mike has also got. So, yes, so that was uh, that works out very well. I don't know if I've ever said I wound up speaking to Brad Fidel on the phone. Oh, wow. Off the back of that. Cool. Yes. Um, yeah, I, d- I don't know how much I can say, but yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we did have a phone call and he did That's see brilliant. that. And so did... Um, the other guy whose name Ross ah I forgot his surname now the guy who <laughs> Levinson, Ross Levinson who played on that score as well I yeah. spoke to him as well so that was pretty cool it is cool how you when you're doing this sort of thing you do get to meet some of your heroes and you know yeah. I mean yeah it's 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 really cool it's a really nice little bonus on the side of doing such such stuff yeah I, I yeah I think uh, only a few years ago that would never happen would it but yeah nowadays uh it can, which yeah, is awesome. absolutely. And of course, these videos, I guess, um, helped bring you to the attention of, of a wider audience. And I just wondered if you could run us through how the whole ARP video came about. You know, who, who instigated that? Did did you approach them? Did they approach you? How did that all happen? So I, uh, it it goes backwards. How I even started doing kind of synth history documentaries was kind of an accident in itself. So. A Lin LM1 came up for sale, and I know, I know they're obviously ridiculously rare, mm-hmm. and I knew there was no way I'd win a, a bid on it because it, everyone was <laughs> after it. So I spoke to the guy who was selling it and said, is there any way I could sample it if I paid you before it disappears, never to be seen again? Um, and he agreed to meet me yeah, in the street to check I wasn't a weirdo, <laughs> uh, and obviously I am. So, <laughs> so um, and he 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 said he didn't want any money, which is really nice of him. But I, I went back to his and sampled it, filmed a little bit with it, and then put a video up on it on mm-hmm. YouTube, just uh, just a short video about the Lin LM1. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know at the time, but nobody had ever given the samples of that drum machine away because it's so rare, and I guess. Why would you if you were? Yeah, you've got one. Um, and that was the first video I'd ever made on YouTube that anybody actually really watched. Up until that point, my videos had, you know, eighty-seven views or something like that. You know, and all of a sudden, that I think I think it's had four hundred and it, I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of views, which was just you know night and day. So I thought, okay, hang on a second. I enjoyed that, and people watched it. So I thought I'll do another one. So I did one on the profit synthesizers. So it, it was obviously about sequential circuits, but rather than being about everything sequential circuits did, it was I, I tried to narrow it down a bit, and I just did every profit from the five to the the X, which was the one that was the latest one out at the time, yeah. and that did equally well. So I thought, great. So somebody who was helping me with that had quite a big collection of Roland synths, and said, "Why don't you do a Roland one?" I thought, "Oh, that's." pretty huge but why not so i gave that a crack so i did i did uh it wound up being about 70 minutes long or something so each each film was getting kind of bigger and bigger started from a five minute film and now we're over an hour <laughs> and during the filming of that a, a guy called ian livingstone got in touch with me he's a very successful uh, film tv and game composer and he'd seen my channel and he said uh, do you want to borrow some synths to which the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so I um, drove over to him. He was a couple of hours away. And I was working on the Roland film. I was just finishing up the Roland film at the time. And he had a couple of Roland synths I hadn't managed to get hold of. So I borrowed them off him to use them uh, to finish off the, the Roland film. And at the same time, he said, do you want to borrow my ARP 2600? <laughs> which is, I mean, what a thing to lend someone. You've only just met, uh, but he did. He lent me his ARP twenty six hundred, and I've I'd seen them before, but I'd never played them. Um, they were just always this amazing looking thing that yeah. you, that you would go, well, what does that do? You know, in the, <laughs> in the corner of a studio. So um, I brought that back. I finished off the Roland film, and that's a whole you know story into itself, which mm-hmm. uh, was a wonderful thing. And then I turned to this 2600 and I thought, right, what's this all about? And I made a track with that 2600. And in the little demo track I did with that 2600, I just flashed up a couple of little old images of of vintage 2600s. And I found this image online and it was an unlabeled image of a guy in a suit standing with a blue Marvin 2600, the original like prototype. 
And I, this image was unlabeled. I thought, I don't know who on earth that is, but that's pretty cool. And I just flashed it up in my mm -hmm. video for a couple of seconds, kind of cheeky because it wasn't my image. <laughs> um, it turned out that guy was Don Muro. And weirder still, it turned out he saw it. Wow. Uh, what are the odds? And he sent me a message to say, I just saw your, he'd just seen the Roland film and then he'd seen the ARP film, the, the little ARP 2600 demo I'd seen. And he said, oh, that image you flashed up just for a couple of seconds of a guy with a blue Marvin, that's me. And I said, no, what? So we, had, <laughs> we then had this conversation and it turned out he knew up personally. He was there. Mm -hmm. He got that from David Friend of ARP directly. It was yeah. the last blue Marvin. They were, wow. it was their prototype. They'd moved on to the production models, and uh, he couldn't afford one, so they uh, gave him the last, sold him the last Blue Marvin, um, and he had a whole, he had recordings of it, he had photos of it, he had all this stuff, and then it turned out he'd worked with ARP, and he bought. It turns out he actually bought uh, one of the. I think it probably is the last thing that came out of ARP. We found out that it actually was the the final day. Wow. Uh, of ARP um, in 81, he got um, he bought their MSL um, project from them and got some of the last bits through on that final day. So he was um, a, f a fascinating person to speak to and, uh, and in general, but because of what he'd done with ARP. I had this 2600. Um, Alan Perlman had obviously not long passed, so the story was in the news as well. So everything was kind of staring me in the face to say, why don't you do something about art? Yeah. So Don said, why don't you speak to Mark Vale, who, of course, has written uh, vintage synthesizers um, and many other things about um, about synths. Um, because, you know, he, he's obviously done a lot of research on that already. And I spoke to Mark and he said, why don't you speak to Dina? who is, uh, it's her family story. It was her father. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll ask if she'll answer a few questions, thinking, you know, maybe she'll give me a little bit of her time. Yeah. Um, and it turns out she was absolutely amazing and just opened doors that would have been impossible to open. And throughout the next year, I wound up speaking to all these original ARP engineers and salespeople um, and making an absolute monster <laughs> <laughs> documentary from, you know, thinking I'll make a short film about ARP. So how long did it actually take from, you know, that, that, that where you would put that beginning that you've mm. just kind of described to the point where you said, that's it, it's in the can, we were ready to go. What what was that length of time? Exactly a year. Yeah. Exactly one year. Wow. Yeah. And so it was bubbling away constantly for a year. And I had a lot of help um, because the first question was, where on earth do you find a 2500? Yeah. Um, and I put, a <laughs> I put a message out on the, the synth boards and I put one up on the Facebook group. And I said, has anyone got a 2500? To which I just got a load of sarcastic replies, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got, I've got seven. I've got, yeah, I've got one in my gar garden, <laughs> one in my garden, you know, all that. And I thought, oh, this is this is not going to end well. Uh, and then a friend uh, hooked me up with another uh, of his friends who hooked me up with his friend. You know, it was a ch friend mm -hmm. of a friend of a friend kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Uh, this guy, Tony, who had oh, uh, yeah. a 20. You know Tony, of course. I know Tony. Uh, yeah. Um, everyone knows Tony. A twenty, <laughs> he had a twenty oh two at the time, which is That's you right. know the it's not it's it's pre twenty five hundred. It's but it's part of that that umbrella of synth. So a few months later, I was sat in his in his place in front of <laughs> uh, the uh, it was a twenty oh two serial number zero zero eight, uh, recording a demo with it. And by the end of the film, we had three twenty five hundreds in it. So. Uh, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and everything else. I think there were about five 2600s in it, umpteen Odysseys, Omni, Selena, you know. And we wound up doing some of the first interviews with with ex art people, people who've never spoken about it before, like Je um, Jeremy Hill in particular. What I didn't know was a project manager on the 2600, designed some of the circuits on it, designed the pro soloist, people like that. Um, and... If you'd have said to that to me on that first day when I was thinking, oh, maybe I could do a film about ARP, mm. that I'd be speaking to these people, you know, I wouldn't have believed you. So yeah. it really unfolded into something amazing. 
very serendipitous. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Well, funnily enough, you funny to say that the, the <laughs> when I first looked at the twenty six hundred, I found an interview, the Nam Oral History in, interview, which I wound up being able to use because obviously Alan uh, passed. Um, and in that interview, he talks about serendipity, like you're saying, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. he talks about he used the word happenstance, which yeah. I know is a, is a common word, but I just for whatever reason I hadn't heard that word before, so I wound up calling my 2600 track happenstance. Uh -huh. And when I uh, first spoke to Dida in about the first five minutes of speaking to her, she used the word happenstance, which made me laugh. It's, uh, <laughs> and then uh, that has been the theme of the yeah. Of the it's like it was all yes. all meant to be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've done similar, you know, I, I like to dabble in, in, in research and history. I, I, I'm kind of very specific, obviously, with things like the Fairlight and, uh, and others. What, what are your research methods? Do you, is, it, is it purely going on the internet, starting off with a Google search, finding some information, something that then backs that up, and then burrowing down that rabbit hole? And, and like you said, having that kind of fortunate chain of events where one friend passes you on to someone else and is there lots of reading involved you know what, what do you what do you do to, to research this stuff well so it, it's it's something that i've just kind of had to figure out for myself and the more you do it the better at it you get and of course you make mistakes along the way mm. uh, which you have to learn from so that each time you do it you don't make those kind of mistakes before so um again so um the internet will get you started but there is a lot of stuff on the internet that is absolute nonsense yeah um and it's not vetted in any way so you can use it to kind of signpost you to things but you if you can get to at least someone who knows what they're talking about who can help you which on the art film it, compared to the earlier films the technical information was uh, far superior because I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got people like Nathan at Synth Chaser, who has had his head inside hundreds and hundreds of ARPs, was able to uh, word things for me or help me if I said, is this right? He could say, usually, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and in fact, some stuff he was, he was able to, you know, you find some bits on, uh, on probably very well-known websites that say state things about ARP, which I know are, are now completely wrong. Yeah. So you do have to be very careful. Uh, and then, yeah, people like, you know, David Friend or Jeremy Hill, who actually designed these instruments, if you get them to tell you how they did it, well, then you can't argue with that. Did, did you find when talking to those people, because I found this when, when talking to people in Fairlight's history, that there are slightly different versions of the same tale and when you end up coming to, you know, this is the thing that I, this is the, the, the narrative I'm going to use. It's a little bit from here and a little bit from there and a little bit from there. Absolutely. I had this conversation. So um, the G-Force guys um, helped, me, uh, helped me out. And I had a conversation with Dave and Chris, and they were saying when they've made documentaries like Bright Sparks, um, that they realized that you could, tell the same story a lot of different ways depending on how you edited it so you do need to be careful that you don't put your own spin on it um and and yes there are times where someone's account of something didn't marry with someone else's and then you have to without saying are you sure about that yeah because <laughs> <laughs> obviously they were there and i wasn't you do um just have to kind of navigate through that and in a couple of instances there were some bits and i went back and spoke to someone they said oh actually now you say that i think this G generally yeah i, I guess it, uh, not really things being wrong but people will always perceive something from their yeah. perspective way so exactly. yeah um, yes we did I did have some different opinions on how something played out 
for yeah, sure. Nostalgia, nostalgia has a funny way of coloring things in in your favor. You know, it makes things that were good nicer and things that were bad worse. And yes. and and I've I've you know experienced that when talking to people who were in the same room thirty years ago, and their version of events is somewhat different. Yeah. And then there's an altercation between those two. Well, it didn't happen like that. Well, it did happen like <laughs> that. And then you have to look, guys. Let's agree on the common truth here, and, and we'll take that as the uh, as the line. So, um, did you have any trouble? I mean, you, you mentioned that there's there's lots of gear in this, and there is a lot of gear. And I have <laughs> to say that it is a two hour long film, and I was slightly daunted by that because you know two hours is a, is a long time uh, in any kind of movie or uh, documentary perspective. But I do find that with films that are of a particular interest to myself those two hours whiz by and these really did whiz by and the the whole film is full of um the instruments um all the different types you, you mentioned that you, you you spoke about the different versions of the 2600 the different iterations and you know the prototypes and stuff was it difficult to track down um all of that gear i mean you said you were offered a lot of this stuff and people came out and helped you and but were there anything was there anything that you couldn't find uh i thought i thought the 2500 was going to be impossible to find but uh that wound up happening um and the 2600 uh I, 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 with some of those we didn't actually film like the blue marvin we just had recordings and photos of one so um through doing things like that we did manage to find everything there were some things because of the pandemic that we were going to be filming which i had to abandon because we weren't going to be filming them so we had to drop a thing with a quadra uh although i had some quadra footage and a solus i had to drop the solus and what right. i was going to do with the avatar has had to be put off so i think i might follow those up with some little extra bits but um is that how you're going to do it? Just like addendums to the the main thing, or do you would you do a director's cut? Maybe. Um, I think little addendums. I think like uh, so. The avatar is uh, it's next to me. You can't see it, uh, and you certainly can't see it on a podcast. <laughs> um, um, so that that is a, something that's really really fascinating to me. The guitar side of it, which nobody uses it for. Uh, and we got lucky. So I'm trying to get mine fixed up so I can actually play it with a guitar because I think that needs a video because that's very, very interesting and it's such a weird sound. Yeah. Um, but we got lucky because it turned out that there was an album done uh, with Drew Schleisinger and David Torn in 1978, oh, yeah. the Avatar from a guitar. I think they must be the only people who did it. <laughs> and um, they just happened to digitize it and release it. A couple of months ago so we wound up being able to use that but i i think there's another video that can be made actually showing yeah. people because no, nobody knows what it sounds like really this weird hexaphonic guitar thing that comes out in stereo yeah i mean i knew the name and i i i, I if i saw one i'd say oh yeah that's an arp avatar but i, I wouldn't couldn't tell you how it sounded uh, or, or 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 what exactly it did, or how it did it, and and the way you covered it in the documentary certainly you know cleared a lot of that stuff up. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, there's more to be had from that one. just reminded me there is a centaur <laughs> there is a centaur six recording which is so the the massive six voice poly which is a fascinating story because it shows you how close arp came to making basically like the prophet five or you know the oberheim obx or something you know yeah. they were looking at a, a poly synth with full articulation per voice with the digital scanning keyboard and they were combining it with the guitar synth thing but it was just too early they weren't using integrated circuits so it just wound right. up being this absolutely 
massive thing that was, yeah. I think it was 15 grand to uh, in parts, which I converted and it's like $60,000 or 60, you know, it was just never going to happen. Um, but yeah, so they tested it out and then they had to just dismantle it and get rid of it. I, I, I think it's still, I think the chassis still exists somewhere because really? photos of it have cropped up. Oh. And I know um, from someone at ARP that they um, sold off, you know, they auctioned everything at the end when it closed down. So I think someone took that. It was just an empty chassis. I know it had been cleared out, but that that's somewhere. Someone's got probably yeah. the, the sensor. But it turns out Bill Singer, who was the demonstrator, recorded something with it before it was taken apart, never, you know, never to be used ever again. And it's on a reel to reel and he found it. But his reel-to-reel player wasn't working, so that needs to get fixed. But then, obviously, that's all been yeah. so. There's all that stuff that will be fascinating to as, as an addendum. Yes, for yeah, sure. or even a part two, oh, yeah. <laughs> the entire part two. This time it's personal. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, yeah well, they, have, well, they have all those instruments. Then they're like Ax Two, Omni Two, Electro Two. Oh, oh, yeah, sure and you know, other people who've got stories like Pete Townsend. It would be amazing to speak to him uh, yes, if we yeah. ever could, because yeah. his story would be a film in its own. And yeah, um, yeah. So, so who knows? it kind of leads me on to my, my next question um, about synth documentaries. I mean, there are so many stories out there um, that that I think not only just satisfy the nerd in all of us synth nerds. But also there's real life stories, you know, you talk about, you know, I was just rewatching uh, part of your, your art video before we came on. Um, and, you know, that, that first section, you know, talks about how um, Alan got to where he got and what he was doing and all these different things and his family and everything. And there are some really fascinating stories just there. So what, where do you see synth documentaries going in the future from now on because we've had a few um and they're, they're they're usually niche so um you know you mentioned um dave and chris's uh bright sparks which yep. I, I think is fantastic Absolutely. um and you referenced that in the film obviously you get some footage yep. from them um there was there's been at least one moog documentary and there's another one that's in the works and hopefully yes. coming soon i hope so yeah uh, yeah um i hope because so, i've backed it um <laughs> So uh, and there's um, there's a Mellotron one, there's an eight oh eight movie, yeah. and they're slowly they seem to be picking up. And there's I Dream of Wires, of course, the whole modular yeah. scene. Um, do you think there is a market for these videos commercially, or is it always going to be, you know, just tickling our sweet spots and 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 that's that? Do you th- what I like about what you do is. Apart from obviously that the two hour like art documentaries, those twenty minute half hour little mini histories, and and they're great in in a way as well, you know, because they, I mean, I go back to that Fairlight uh, one or the Terminator two one that you you know talks about the Fairlight. It's it's there for Terminator fans, film fans, scoring fans, Fairlight fans, you know, um, fans of Arn- Arnold Schwarzenegger voiceovers. It's all you know. It, where, where do you see the whole synth documentary thing going in the next few years? Yeah, I think with think like the ARP film, I think we went, there's the human stories, which are really interesting, which I hadn't had access to with my other films. I'd been making them, you know, from a distance. I didn't interview Roland engineers. I did get some help from Roland, but I didn't speak to anybody in Japan who was originally there. Um, ditto uh, the other films. So, that part of it is fascinating but a lot of what i do just goes really deep into the technology in a way that would just not be appropriate i don't think for like a a general viewing thing um so i think they will remain that kind of film will remain very niche um so i I just don't think you'd get a, a market for it but something that's broader appeal i think the the terminator one is a a great example because and that's had a lot of views it's had a lot of views twice because it got pulled for copyright oh, really? I, yeah. <laughs> um 
and I uh, well, they I I had some stills from the film in it. I didn't use any footage. I just had stills, but you know, it's their prerogative, and they yeah. the studio deemed that I'm not allowed to do that. So I remade it with uh, Terminator action figures. <laughs> that was my workaround, which is now well, that's become... a lesson you've learned, isn't it? You know, I, yeah. I've fallen foul of stuff like that before, and you just think, okay, well, next time we don't use footage or we don't use pictures. You know, maybe mm. we come up with a unique thing, and you came up with a really unique idea you used the model action figures which is great that was my workout and then i wound up thought well i'll make that a thing so in when i did one about escape from new york which alan howarth did an interview for amazingly which is absolutely fascinating i then yeah used a model snake pliskin for that yeah so that i didn't <laughs> didn't Brilliant. fall foul of the um the studio there but yeah i think things like that that are linked to a film or or some bit of history that you uh, might have a connection to without necessarily being into the tech yeah. is is much more marketable because I've spoken to my friends who have absolutely no interest in synthesizers <laughs> whatsoever and they've all watched my Terminator film and all said oh I found that really interesting and they could follow it without needing to know really what a Fairlight is uh, you know that you know you don't need to go into you know the the tech of that. So what's next in the world of, of Alex Ball documentaries? Um, I, at the moment, I'm, I'm not starting another documentary right now because um, I wanted to let the ARP thing sit because it was just such a huge thing. You don't want to go, and that's done, so let's move on. You know, yeah. Let's enjoy that. Um, it was a huge project. A lot of people helped uh, and, and gave a lot to make that happen. So I'd, I'd like to just let that sit for a bit. Um, I've, yeah, I've got quite a lot on this year. We're having a third child soon, so wow! Congratulations, thank you. Um, so I don't want to uh, stretch myself with sure with things I don't have to be doing. So um, no immediate plans. I've got um, you can see them. Obviously, people on the podcast can't, but I've got some bits behind me that I'm doing shorter videos with. So I've I've just done a couple of videos with a huge Roland System 100M. Um, four cab system. So I'm doing s some bits with that, which I think is really interesting because um, there's not that much stuff out there with a big system. You can see two cabs behind me. There's actually yeah. there's I had to move it, but there's uh, I've had five in in uh, which is awesome. Uh, and then I've just got just borrowed these, which are some rare AMS um, rack mount things. The uh, RMS X16. Yes, which is like the eighties reverb, isn't it? Yeah, that non-linear thing. So, um, and the delay, which is on the other side, which yeah. is uh, does, apparently does sampling. I haven't even turned it on yet. Yeah, and that's how it uh, does the delay, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Right. So you yeah. can use it as a sampler, apparently. Yeah, that's right. I think um, was it Martin Hannett was using it as, as such when he was doing you know Joy Division and an early New Order and, and stuff like that. Right, I might so, be wrong, but so if you couldn't yeah. afford a fair light, you, you used to, <laughs> yeah, quite, <laughs> yeah. So, I was gonna say, yeah, so basically at the moment, I'm just doing shorter videos about particular pieces of kit that are of interest. So, I think with that RMX, um, because it's like the 80s reverb, I think that could be a and it, like we we're just talking about a, a topic that's generally interesting. Yeah, it's like the the reverb sound of the eighty. Well, I mean, there's a couple, isn't there? But it's one yeah. of yeah, absolutely um, the defining kind of eighties reverb sounds, and then I can demonstrate why. So I think yeah, in the in the future, that's what I'm the immediate future things like that. Very quickly, just to end up on, you know, what's the one piece of gear that you would love to make a documentary movie about in the future? One, just one. Oberheim. Oh, do okay. you mean a gear or gear? Yeah, I think. Um, I think yeah, whether it's an individual piece of gear or brand, you know, just yeah, that one thing. I think the Oberheim story, uh, those seventies Sem based Oberheims are something else, and I think there's a. I mean, again, Dave Spears has done like the video on the eight, the Oberheim eight voice, uh, and I had a very quick go on that, but um, I know from having spoken to everybody who knows, you know, that is, a, a, you know a heck yeah. of a thing yeah. uh, even even the two voice and then there's the whole world of the you know the obx obxa ob8 I, I have played an ob8 then there's the dmx which is a whole story of its own yeah so there's i think that's something i would love 
to explore at if I can at some point. But Brilliant. um yeah, I think I've got I've got a note behind DX, which is awesome. The the little brother of the DMX, and I've played with an expander and an OB8, but I'm and then the modern OB6, but I've barely touched it, and I'm aware yeah. that it's it's a a universe unto itself. Quite well, we look forward to that whenever that appears. But you've got a yeah. lot on your plate, so 20, uh... 2029. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Alex, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you and to meet you in this virtual sense. It's been fascinating hearing about how you, you made uh, the art video, which is available on YouTube still, yeah? Yep. There's, that's, there's two versions of it. There's uh, the one I uploaded, and then there's a slightly updated cut, which is on the Alan R. Perlman Foundation page as well. Okay, so, so yeah. take Excellent. your pick. Yes. Yeah, go and look at that. And uh, your YouTube channel is? It's just youtube.com forward slash Alex Ball Music. Brilliant stuff. Alex, thank you ever so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening and be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcast website page where you can explore what's playing on the other channels. I'm Rob Pericelli and this has been a failed Muso production for Sound on Sound.